I'd like to invite the next speaker and then we will have the uh, discussion thereafter. So it's my pleasure to introduce Juan Ochoa, Ochoa? Ochoa. <laughs> who comes from, <coughs> from the US. Uh, he is now ICU Medical Director at the Hunterton Medical Center. He is also a surgeon by training, fellow of the American College of Surgeons and fellow of the SCCM, and as well as a honorary professor. The challenge for him will be to convince us of the safety and benefits of increasing protein delivery in the ICU. Please, Juan. Thank, thank you, Professor. Um, so I uh, have worked mostly uh, at uh, University of Hospitals, University of Pittsburgh, where I did my training and stayed there as a professor. Right now I'm in the process of trying to wind down and uh, work in my vineyard, uh, and I work in a small community hospital. And one of the things is the lessons that I have learned in, in this uh, community hospital, which is where the reality of, uh, of uh, providing adequate nutrition support really m meets the road. It's where I have to work with people that, while very interested in providing care, are not interested in being very scientific about it. So I'm going to really focus on, and uh, here's my disclosures. Um, I was a former chief medical officer for uh, Nestle. Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, relationships at this point uh, with, with uh, Nestle other than I still give lectures uh, like uh, this lecture today for educational purposes. So uh, the, the challenge uh, right now is how do we marry the guidelines that are changing in the new paradigm? And I real, will stress there is a new paradigm in nutrition uh, that is a reflection of a new philosophy in nutrition and critical care with practical aspects of how we do nutrition support on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things that is fascinating is, and we saw it this morning in the introductory lectures, everybody talks about equivalency studies, and they did studies in pharmacology and looking at different uh, 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 pharmacological agents, but nobody talks about equivalency studies in, in nutrition, and uh, we'll look at those uh, in, in this lecture. Uh, we've already said that uh, if we follow, by the way, on uh, what is called process management and follow the journey of the patient through their stay coming from home to returning home, there is a, an episode of a crisis in nutritional intake that ha generally happens when the patient goes to the hospital and more when the patient is admitted to the ICU, where the amount of nutrition that the patient can volitionally intake is reduced quite dramatically uh, in, in our patients. Now, we see what uh, is supposedly uh, a gradual increase in the first six to 10 days, which is the average length of stay in an ICU uh, in nutritional intake. But we fall into this gap, in, and that's been uh, worked, uh, in, and there's uh, ongoing trials uh, by Arthur Van Santen and, and uh, Van der Waal and others around the globe saying what happens afterwards, which is really important. And I unfortunately will only mention that in, in one of my last slides uh, because I will concentrate on how our paradigms have changed in the first seven days and how important that is. Now, we know in, uh, from work uh, by Jean-Louis Van Sant and uh, by John Kellum in the United States that there are real different phases in the intensive care unit and that we have to really pay attention uh, at real uh, many, many uh, issues in the ICU. So we have to resuscitate the patient in the first 24, 48 hours, and then we optimize care. And in that, we have to fit nutrition uh, and medical nutrition therapy. So. Um, for ages, and since 1968, since we uh, human beings were able, uh, thanks to Stan Dudrick and others, able to give nutrition by parenteral nutrition, we, were, uh, we had this idea that nutrition support and medical nutrition therapy was something that we would do to avoid a caloric deficit, and that a caloric deficit and that decrease in nutrition intake was pathologic. And therefore, that we had to intervene because it was the caloric deficit that produced the disease-related malnutrition in our patients. Um, and so the whole idea and the whole paradigm in nutrition for 50 years was, up until recently, the idea that nutrition support is a food substitution therapy. And so... Um, 
And there was this concept of that food probably is not going to cause that much harm. So let's just do it and let's, again, avoid this caloric deficit and substitute really early on on food, uh, on food intake. And this is very well characterized in one of the trials, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, EPANIC trial, uh, and uh, demonstrating uh, that you could indeed uh, uh, give more uh, uh, calories and protein through parenteral nutrition supplementation in patients and avoid that caloric deficit. And lo and behold, um, uh, the demonstration was that there was actually some harm. Now, you can criticize any of these studies um, by, uh, by uh, going into them, um, but the truth is that after multiple studies that one way or another test the idea of the food substitution paradigm, that is avoiding a caloric deficit, that there is either no benefit or the potential for harm in providing aggressive early nutrition support to avoid a caloric deficit. As those trials were being done, and as we focused on calories, and the focus on calories is of historic interest, and, and I won't get too much into that, but nutrition, clinical nutrition, has focused on calories because population nutrition has focused on calories. That is, how do we feed millions of people around the globe and how do we prevent starvation around the globe? And so we focused on calories there. And the whole idea is, if you feed 70% of the calories, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. We started also to get signals that when we feed only about 50 grams of protein, which is what the average person gets in an ICU currently when you're not doing quality improvement measures, that seemed to be not sufficient, that we had to increase protein intake to about 1.3 grams per kilogram per day. Now, that did not tell us when and what about the timing. Should we do protein substitution and avoid a nitrogen deficit early on or not. And these studies now have been quite clear in coming uh, with the, uh, this trial that was uh, shown by Arthur, because it's from his group, uh, showing that feeding too little protein is bad, feeding too much protein early is bad, and just a gradual rise, a gradual increase in protein intake is what we need to do. And so suffice it to say that today in, this, in the studies uh, in the Nutria trial just suggests the same thing. We need to be lower. We cannot and we should not be meeting caloric nor nitrogen goals early on in the ICU. That is, the starvation, the starvation of illness is a physiologic event up to a point. When that point is, we still have to uh, determine that. But let's, uh, let's say that at this point, the best guess without individualizing patient care, and I will emphasize that it needs to be individualized, is somewhere around seven days. And that you should, by that point, say the starvation response, the physiologic starvation response is either over or the compensation has, has, is just not capable of being maintained. And you know this uh, trial that uh, Arthur uh, demonstrated. Now, the next question for me is a very practical question. And this became, for me, a big problem with COVID when I had 170 patients in the ICUs at one night. And I was having the head of orthopedics be my intern. Now, being an intern in surgery is good, but being the, an orthopedic surgeon, being your intern, is even worse. Uh, and so I had to make it so that we made it simple. And roughly, we have three generations of enteral nutrition products. The first generation, uh, which is the generation that we could we call the standard formulas, give us about 15 to 20 percent protein, a little bit less than 20 percent, about 16 to 18 percent protein. These formulas come historically one from what were called the starvation experiments uh, in the castaway experiments done in during the Second World War and taken to us as the, the population experiments. These formulas are based on saying if we give a ton of carbohydrates, a lot of carbohydrates, about 50% or more of the calories, we can minimize the amount of protein because protein is expensive. And so that's what these standard formulas do. A second generation, increase protein, but maintain calories. And so we call them high protein isocaloric. And then in the last five to 10 years, as the studies were coming, 
and demonstrating that we were probably feeding too many calories initially, the, uh, the, uh, there is a final generation or a generation that has come with very high protein energy restricted diets. They're not all equivalent, by the way, they come from different companies, they're not equivalent. Some have higher carbohydrates, some have lower carbohydrates, some have more lipids, some have less lipids. And so <clears throat> I cannot show equi uh, equivalency studies between these, but I'll show you some data that compares the three different, the different, different data, <clears throat> different formulas. <clears throat> so if I have to say my bias and I have to show my bias, and I'm going to use this example, I am going to eventually feed a patient 1.3 grams per kilogram per day of protein by seven days, uh, and I am going to try to achieve that goal. One of my biases now, and one of my changes now in my daily practice, is I do not allow my, my dietitians to calculate nutrition intake based on calories, because we have already showed that calories don't matter. And so I focus on protein. So I, this is our goal. And we're going to try to achieve 1.3 grams per kilogram per day, ideal body weight. If I use a traditional standard formula, I will end up giving to that patient a huge amount of sugar. And re re remember, all of these central nutrition formulas, with minimal exceptions, use simple sugars. Do not use complex carbohydrates. And so that's important. I'm going to give 300 grams. That is seven quarters of, uh, or 75, uh, seven, uh, almost three quarters of a pound of sugar in a patient with a standard formula. And I'm going to give an excessive amount of calories. If I use a high protein isocaloric formula, I will probably be around 100% of both and reach my goals uh, doing that. Uh, and by the way, this is calculated, uh, you will give about 20 to 25 kcals per kilogram per day if you do this. And uh, if I give a high, very high protein energy restricted formula, I'm going to give 70% of the calories, but still meet the 1.3 grams per kilogram per day. And that becomes important. So is this safe? Particularly, uh, so my, my personal bias is we should never be hitting 170% uh, of uh, calorie goals. And my personal thing is these formulas are of historic interest at this point in the ICU. And so what if we compare by doing an equivalency study uh, between high protein isocaloric formulas and very high protein energy restricted formulas? And that's what we did in a prospective randomized open label trial in seven and multi-center trial in seven studies with Todd Rice being the uh, principal investigator and I was the uh, senior investigator in this trial. And what we did is we again prospectively compared patients to receive a high protein uh, isocaloric formula with 64 grams of protein and 112 grams of, uh, of uh, uh, carbohydrates. Uh, compared to an experimental formula that received 92 grams of protein and only 76 grams of carbohydrates. And this is important because most studies do not discuss caloric restriction from a point of view of restriction of carbohydrates or restriction of fat or, or different types of restriction. They just add one thing or, or, or another. Uh, and, and it was about the same amount of fat, although the, 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 there were different types of lipids in, in these formulas. And what we found, and we looked at the metabolic effects and we looked at safety. What we found, and this is a, a work by uh, Finfer, uh, is uh, the, the idea of dispersion. So we used the same principle that Finfer had used of dispersion. And what we found is that indeed, the dispersion of glucose levels in patients receiving the experimental very high protein energy restricted formula was significantly less, and we had significantly less hyperglycemias above 10 millimoles, uh, and seemed to have less hypoglycemias, although we did not have enough data to reach statistical significance. And we did have a mean average decrease about 12 points uh, in blood sugars. So in the world of nutrition, the commercialization of uh, formulas is done without uh, the process that is done in, in pharmacy. So these formulas could be commercialized and are now commercialized worldwide. 
when I was at Oshner Medical Center, uh, uh, one of the things that I did was I implemented a quality improvement measure in our surgical intensive care unit, and this is the change before in the glucose levels before and after we implemented very high protein energy restricted diets as a standard of care. And what you see is a dramatic reduction of almost 28% or 28.5% in hyperglycemias just by changing the diet alone. And the other thing when we compare to our, uh, other intensive care units, and there's a little bit of apples and oranges, but what is important is the number of patients that had significant hypoglycemic events decreased significantly because insulin utilization also decreased. So we were seeing at least a more physiologic metabolic benefit of using energy restriction. We also saw other benefits. One of the benefits that was quite dramatic was that in alkaline phosphatase, with a progressive difference between a high-protein isocaloric formula and a very high-protein energy-restricted formula. And what you see is really what you're seeing is fatty acid accumulation in the liver. And so you see a significant uh, increase in fatty acid and in fat accumulation in the livers when you give high-protein isocaloric formulas compared to very high-protein energy-restricted formulas. You also see a benefit in minute ventilation with decreased CO2 uh, and obviously a decreased need for bicarbonate compensation by the kidneys. But what also was important in, in one of the previous lectures, uh, we talked that ketones, allowing some ketones was important and may be important in the benefit for the patients is that people that had an energy restriction had measurable ketones in their urine and in their blood. And so there was a statistical increase in ketones, and not surprisingly, there was a significant decrease in white blood cell counts in those patients also by day seven. So we saw at least some metabolic benefits and some suggestion of benefits with, uh, in this comparison. But what happens in the real world? And in the real world, this is at Geisinger with almost 2,000 patients, 1,899. In the real world, what you see uh, is that about 68% of our patients are overweight or obese. Now, I would say this is the U.S., but the truth is that this is also worldwide, uh, and uh, whether we like it or not. And only 5% of our patients are cachectic. So the idea that we are still working on cachexia is not true. 95% of our patients have other metabolic requirements and come with a metabolic history that is very different. Now, some of these patients undoubtedly have sarcopenia, and, uh, we'll, we, and, and that's important to look. But we were able to retrospectively compare uh, in, uh, intake between the different formulas, again, focusing not on isolated macro or micronutrients, but the formulas themselves. And we compare them with between the those that receive the standard formula, a high protein, and a very high protein energy restricted formula. And what you see is that the number of calories are generally the same because we are statistically the same because patients end up receiving dextrose and propofol and, uh, uh, as part of their therapies uh, and their other treatments. But that protein intake is gradually increased and that naturally we're not following the guidelines Thank, uh, or, or the previous guidelines where we were trying to prevent the caloric deficit, but that naturally it seems people are going and slowly, gradually increase protein. However, having said that, when you have a standard diet compared to a very high protein diet, by the end of seven days, you get about a 40 gram difference in protein intake per day, uh, and you meet protein goals of 1.1, uh, 1.3 grams per kilogram per day in those patients. Uh, so it's interesting that there's that difference. We did a multivariable analysis, and we looked again at safety, but as importantly, we looked at, is there a marker that we could potentially use for a prospective randomized trial? And what we found at 30 days is that there was a proportional decrease in, pr in uh, mortality that was, again, proportional to the amount of protein intake. So the more protein, the lower the mortality. Now, I will caution everybody, this association is not causality. 
And that becomes really important. This is merely an association. But it tells us at least that we did not see any signals of harm. And it also tells me that if we're going to use a primary endpoint in a prospective trial, 28, 30-day mortality is not a bad endpoint to do in these studies. And so, again, I have to sit there and say, how do I simplify this process so that anybody, uh, and I use my orthopedics uh, attending, can give uh, uh, nutrition? Now, thankfully, we don't have that uh, problem, and I now am back to baseline, but still, my other colleagues are not as motivated as, uh, as I am to calculate every little detail in nutrition. So what do I do? And this is an example. So I do this gradual increase. And what is important is that if I meet, I want to meet a, a little bit of protein, I give the patients just 10 to 12, 10 to 15 milliliters per, kilo, uh, per, per hour in my patient. There are a very high protein energy restricted formula. And I do individualize it, and there's some patients that I won't do this. I increase it to 25 milliliters an hour by day three to five or four to six, something like that. And then after day seven, I meet, uh, I go to about 45 milliliters an hour. This simplifies the entire process. I don't need to do anything more. So from the point of view of simplifying nutrition therapy, this becomes really easy and is, is easily applicable. What happens after the seven days? And I'm going to say it, I, this is what I do. And I want to caution, there's still a lot of work to be done after seven days. And so if I have a patient that is morbidly obese, I have to, I cannot ignore that they're morbidly obese. I cannot ignore that. In fact, I have a patient that I left uh, on Sunday with a BMI of 82 in respiratory failure because of a BMI of 82. So I have to find a way to feed that patient. And I will continue energy restriction in those patients uh, after day seven. And I will focus on are they receiving enough or not enough protein, and I do use urea to creatinine ratios quite significantly. And I will, and I do think that indirect calorimetry has a big role in these patients after day seven. It helps me a lot. Now, if the patient is, on the other hand, a, a patient that is normal, I try to hit somewhere around 80 to 100% of their uh, energy goals, and I, again, increase my protein the same way that, uh, that Arthur does. I am not as aggressive, although I think that we may end up being right at increasing our aggressiveness. And if I have that 5% of my patients with cachexia, in those patients, as I follow those patients, I do increase my energy intake significantly because they are both protein and calorie depleted. So that is what I do in my practice. So in summary, I am going to uh, end uh, with this uh, editorial that I uh, wrote in JAMA as one of the clinical trials came out, uh, saying feed carefully, feed in moderation, start carefully, and then ramp up. And then at some point, really individualize the care, particularly after seven days, really start thinking, what does this patient really need? And so nutrition in the ICU anymore, and we need to abandon that idea, not anymore is about food substitution. That idea is gone. It's about metabolic care. It's trying to not cause metabolic harm. There is, there is no reason for us to continue to cause metabolic harm in those patients. I want to thank you very much, and uh, we'll take any questions.